Thank you guys so much for listening today. I'm super, super, super excited to announce who I have. I always say that. I always just get so amped because I just have the best people. Um, today, I have my wonderful friend, a top-notch lifestyle blogger that empowers women to live their best life through style, beauty, and wellness. Welcome, Claire Gents. Gents, dang it! Gents, no, you got it. Yeah, the second time you got it, Claire Gents. I know. My maiden name was Maxwell, and it was so much easier to pronounce. I even practiced, you guys. I literally practiced right before this. <laughs> hey, I could barely, I feel like, say it right the first however six months I was with Steven, so it's fine. <laughs> no, but thank you so much for having me on today. I am so excited. Um, I guess for those of you guys that probably don't know, so Janelle and I actually met at Rachel Hollis's Rise Business Conference earlier this year and just like instantly connected and... Janelle, you already know this, but I love what you're doing. And I think what you're doing is so important because so many women need that like boost of confidence and just to feel empowered. So anyway, super excited to be here today. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on. I'm, I'm pumped about our topics because we are talking about some taboo stuff. You guys, I recently did a little poll on Instagram that said, what are taboo topics you guys wish that people were talking more about? And I took directly from that list and I chose like four different topics that have to do with relationships um, because Claire and Steven have such a fun marriage and I, I love their marriage. Like when Frankie and I met Claire and Steven, it was like this instant foursome, well, that sounds weird, but you know, <laughs> connection. <laughs> we just, the four um, of us just instantly bonded. We really did. Yeah. It was really, really fun. So whether you are single, dating around, in a relationship, married, this episode is going to have massive value for you and lots of great tips. Um, and yeah, the reason why I chose Claire for this episode is because I love her and Steven's marriage. And I think it's so important to have marriages that are um, strong and um, I don't know. And I was even listening to your guys' podcast. Oh yeah. Tell everyone about your podcast. Oh, okay. So yeah, my husband and I, so yeah, my husband, obviously his name is Steven. We have a podcast called the husband and wife podcast. And really we just kind of dive into a bunch of lifestyle topics as a married couple. And so some of them are definitely on relationships, but there's others where the topics themselves kind of in this case, whether you're single dating you know, engaged or married, they're applicable to everyone. And we just kind of have a very, it's pretty like raw and unfiltered. We literally don't do any editing, but it's just kind of like off the cuff and you know, how we're really feeling and thinking and what we've experienced. So it's just, you can grab a cup of coffee, glass of wine, hang out with us and hopefully get a bunch of good laughs, mostly for my husband <laughs> and like get some good takeaways at the end of it. Yes. I love that. Okay, cool. So it's called the husband and wife podcast. podcast yeah. And so you guys can go check them out. Um, you know, obviously Apple and Spotify and all that good stuff. Yes. Subscribe five stars. You know, the drill, you guys, I asked the same thing of mine too. So just the same. And then the last thing we'll say before we officially dive in is if you want to look at Claire while you're watching or well, you could be watching this right now on YouTube, or you could be uh, listening to this listening. podcast. So if you want to check her out on Instagram, her Instagram is at Claire, and that's C-L-A-I-R-E. And then her last name, Gens. Yes. yes, I did it. G-U-E-N-T-Z. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do this. Okay. So let's start by hearing how you and Steven met, how long you dated, and then how long you've been married now. Okay, so Stephen and I actually met on the dating app Hinge, and um, I know, it's, I feel like, so we met at this point about four years ago, and so that was when dating apps were just kind of, I don't want to say taboo, because I don't know, I've never really thought of them as that one way or the other, but I, they obviously weren't as common as they are now, because now I feel like that's how so many people meet. But um, so Hinge had just come to Raleigh, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I live now. But I was in nursing school at the time and I was doing an internship, a summer internship at Duke. And I had just gotten out of a really long relationship. And I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to casually date. I'm just going to have fun. And so one of my friends recommended that I download the app. So anyway, so I downloaded the app and I actually had, um, I think I downloaded it like on a Monday. and. I had a date with someone else set for that. Um, I think it was like that Friday. 
<coughs> Sorry, guys, I'm getting over a cough. Um, so anyway, and then I had met Steven that second day on the app. We had talked that night. He asked, you know, we exchanged numbers. We were texting the next day and he was like, all right, well, like, when can you meet? And I thought, well, I can literally meet you tomorrow. And I was thinking, and I have another date on Friday and then I'm out of town <laughs> for a week. So I was like, well, I can either meet you tomorrow or a week from now. And he was like, tomorrow. So anyway, so we ended up meeting and I left our first date. And I remember I went and grabbed pizza with a friend and I was like, I know this is going to sound a little psycho, but I'm going to cancel that date I have tomorrow because I just know that this is who I'm going to marry and I don't need to go on that date. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. I love that. That's amazing. When you know, you know. Yeah. And you were just getting on the app literally thinking to yourself that it was going to be this like chill, low key, like just to get over your ex basically. Yeah. I mean, so I, yeah, we had been, I had been with my ex at the time for about three or four years and, um, you know, nothing we, you know, broke up and it was like pretty amicable, like nothing was wrong, but I just knew like, okay, if we've been together for this long and I just, we still quite aren't at that marriage point or like, I don't know if that's what I want, that I was like, then I probably need to kind of take a step back and, you know, kind of do my own thing or focus on myself for a while. And if it's meant to be with him, then it'll happen. But I didn't feel like, unless I was a hundred percent sure and, you know, I feel like I, we had been together long enough. I was old enough at that point. I was like, something just isn't quite, like, I couldn't put my finger on it, but just something wasn't aligning. So anyway, yeah, so I was like, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just here for the summer. You know, I'll just kind of like, because I had never honestly, like, kind of dated casually before that. I'd always been in, like, longer relationships. So I was like, oh, it'll just be like a fun summer. And then, you know. And then you met the man yes. of your dreams that is not your husband. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That. That's so cool. Okay, cool. So how old were you when you met Steven? So we were 26 when I met and um, we, I think, did you ask how long we dated before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, 26 when we met and then I think we met, yeah, this um, during the summer, like a June or July and then we ended up getting engaged that following March and then we got married a little over a year later. Cool. So, so that was kind of like, the timeline. Like eight, eight months or something? Nine months? Yeah, about eight months. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's cool. awesome. So yeah. Cool. So yeah, it was one of those things that, I mean, I've asked him, I think I knew a little, I mean, like I said, leaving our first date and I never really believed in that phrase, you know, when you know, you know, and I don't think that necessarily happens to everyone. Obviously there's plenty of people in like, really happy, like happy, happy marriages that weren't like, Oh, like I knew right away. But I, that was the first time I was like, oh, okay. I feel like I actually now understand why people say that. Yeah, totally. And I sometimes think it has to do with like the age too. Like if you're younger and you start dating your person, like high school or college, then you might not have quite that same, like when For you sure. know type thing, because yeah. you didn't really know what you wanted. You just like, you like don't really know yourself at that point. Right. So like yeah. you maybe fell in love and then, yeah, now they, now that couple might be married and have an awesome marriage. And so they wouldn't have that same story. But I, I think, and I could be wrong, but it seems like when you're a little bit older, like um, 25, 26, 27, like mid twenties and above, you kind of, you know yourself so well at that point that you do have a better idea of what you're looking for. And then for sure. you end up having a little bit more of that, like I knew immediately type feeling. Yeah, no, totally agree. So I love that you met on Hinge, first of all, because I love Hinge of all the dating apps. Like I didn't use dating apps that much when I was single, but I used, um, Bum no, I never used Bumble because I didn't want to have to be the one to reach out to a guy. I was like, I want, I'm old fashioned. He has to reach out to me. Yeah. You're like, no, I did, that's not I did Tinder actually like four years ago for literally 48 hours. It was, it was a nightmare. Yeah. Steven was on that one quite a bit before we met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, this is not very classy. But, um, then I went on hinge a couple years after that. And I actually met a lot of really nice guys because I feel like hinge has a little bit more of a stigma around, like, I think their slogan is less swiping, more liking. So it's, yeah. Like, and it's like, like the app to be, I think deleted. It's changed a lot since, you know, I was on it, but yeah, I definitely feel like it's a little bit of a different, I always like to say, it wasn't Tinder, but it wasn't match.com. It yeah. was like right in the middle. Yeah, totally. And this isn't an ad, by the way, for Hinge anyone, but like, I mean, Hinge, if you want to pay us, you can. It's yeah. fine. I, I actually <laughs> have worked with them because I reached out to them after yeah. we met because they were doing all these campaigns. I was like, hey, we're actually like a real 
hinge success story if you yes. want to collect. Yes. I love that. That's amazing. So, okay. I often have friends and clients who will tell me they're like, I just, I don't believe in dating apps because I really want to meet someone the old fashioned way. And I'm always like, yes, of course, everyone wants to meet someone the old fashioned way. But what would you say to someone who is not willing to download a dating app? Cause I think it's like stupid, but they're also unhappily single and wishing they could meet someone. I think, you know, it's one of those things where you know, ideally, if you could just like, oh, bump into someone in a coffee shop, or I guess I feel like from my point of view, nowadays, everyone is so, I, I hate using the word like everyone's so busy, but like, you know, everyone has like their own routines and their own lives. And to meet someone organically, I feel like, I know for me, like, yes, there's a chance, like if you're out at night with your girlfriends, like you could meet someone at a bar, but I feel, and this might be a little bit of a, not a, this isn't meant to be judgmental, but just the thought it. is, yeah, I'm just going to say, but I always think like, if I'm out late at like a bar or a club, God, I, that hasn't happened in how many years, but it's like, are those the type of people, or is that the type of person that you, like those people probably aren't looking to settle down or for a serious relationship. And I'm not saying that in like a negative way, but I just think, you know, certain environments are prone to like certain, you know, behaviors or just like whatever your life kind of goals and values are at that time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I just think, you know, dating apps, especially, they're just like efficient. You know, you can sort through essentially for lack of a better word, like so many different prospects, see like a little bit about them, get to know them on some sort of surface level so you at least are like okay is this someone that i would want to spend my time going to hang out with versus i feel like you know if you're out and just like trying to meet someone you don't know if someone's single you don't know if they're looking for a relationship you don't know anything about them and so the right. chances of just kind of like organically bumping into someone um i'm not saying it's not possible but if being in a relationship is something like finding your person is something that you want at this point and it's you know on your mind then i just feel like why not try why not try a dating app yeah i guess i just don't really see the downside to it yeah i think sometimes people think like oh i'm so busy i don't have time for it i think maybe actually i think sometimes it might just be like the embarrassment of saying like we met online or something like that because um I feel like they're like, I don't know. It's just not a cute story. Like people want like a meet cute story where they like, you know, yeah, they met at a coffee shop or they met on like a bus or they like accidentally both turned the same corner at the same time and bumped into each other, you know? And, right. and of course, like Hollywood makes that stuff seem so beautiful and fun because it's, it, it is, it's like fun to like bump into someone and then, and to meet them. But like you said, they might have all the qualities you're looking for, but I think that back in the day that maybe happened more where people were just like meeting someone. They're, yeah. And they're not like constantly like working or like, I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it. I mean, we just spend so much time online these days. I mean, there's not, it's just a very different climate now than it was, you know, 20 years ago. Right. And the other thing that I'll say is that like, I think people are getting pickier also, which I don't think is a bad thing. I always encourage people to make a list of 20 things they're looking for in right. their future husband or future wife. And then also to make a list of 20 things that they have to offer. So it's not just about looking at the other person. It's looking at like, who are you? Are you the right person? Um, but like, as we get pickier, we want more and more and more things because with social media, we're able to see so many different types of people. Right. So I, I believe our standards have gone up a lot of what we're looking for. So I, if you take that high standard and then you are wanting this organic meet cue on the side of the road it may happen but it might take 10 or 20 years and if you're willing to wait that long great do it but also yeah but you have sorry go ahead go ahead yeah <laughs> no i was just gonna say but you have to think like is it worth like if it's something that you if you really want to find a partner it's like is it worth you know foregoing you know all because you can still go try to meet someone in person but why not also have an app that can increase your chances. And I think it's funny because when people ask me, oh, how'd you guys meet? I'm always like, oh, it's such a cute story. Like we met on Hinge. And, but I do know what you're saying because I've also had women message me and I've asked, oh, well, how does your family feel that you met on the dating app? Or how does it feel when you tell people? And maybe it's because I just 
genuinely don't really care what other people think, but I've just never really thought anything of it. And so for me, I mean, just kind of like a rule in life, it's if someone's going to judge you for something that you're doing, and if someone in this case is going to judge you for a dating app, people usually judge people out of a place of like insecurity. Um, so I just feel like if it's something you want to do and there's a chance that you could find your partner on there, then why not? I'm like, who cares? Why not do it? Right. And I will say one more thing about Hinge, still on an ad, but one thing that's cool is that you can actually put different toggles on it. So you can be like, if you want a certain faith, like for me, when I went on, I wanted to find a Christian guy. And yeah, just because a guy toggles Christian on the app doesn't necessarily mean he's like the type of Christian I'm looking for, like someone who goes to church and, and really like is devout to their faith, but you have a way better chance, right? So same right. scenario of you talking about the bar thing, like I could also find a Christian at a bar for sure, because I'm a Christian and I go to bars. So I could find my Christian at a bar, but to me, I'm probably going to have a higher likelihood of finding a single guy who is in like, you can put the age range, you can put the height range, you can put like where he yeah, lives, exactly. you all these things and you can put the faith. And so I'm like, well, why wouldn't I, you know, why wouldn't I try to like put that out there and and you guys know who's list like everyone listening probably know that my husband and I Frankie we met through Instagram through mutual friends and it's because I actually told those mutual friends um I actually they were strangers when I met them and told them literally within five minutes of meeting them they told me they had a men's mastermind and I said do you have any men in your mastermind who are strong faith work out a bunch entrepreneur like I list off like probably four or five things that I was really looking for in a man and they were like, you know what? Actually, we do. And they introduced us on Instagram. And Frankie and I follow each other on Instagram for like eight months before we ever met in person. And so that's kind of like meeting online. And it's because yeah. I'm willing to um, say what I was looking for and put myself out there to a total stranger who told me that they like have contact with a lot of awesome men. Right. Yeah. I just think, you know, in general, if it's something that you want, like you have to just put yourself out there and you know, again, there's no harm in trying different things. It's like, who cares? Like, what do you have to lose? Yeah. And you can always take it slow too. That's the other thing I hear is right. people, like, I'm going to be stressed out. I have to go on, it's so much work. I have to go on dates every night of the week. It's like, you really don't. Like I have one friend who, and I won't mention her name, but when she does it, I really respect how she goes about it. Cause she doesn't talk to five different guys at once. If she connects with a guy on, on the app, she might even delete the app or not use the app for another three or four months if, if they're talk if she's talking with this guy. Right. You know, she's not trying to date 10 guys at once. You can meet someone, get to know them for a few months or a few weeks or whatever, and get off the app for that time and then get back on. So you don't have to be this like stressful back-to-back -back dating type situation. Right. Totally agree. Cool. Um, and then the last thing about dating apps, what do you think is a good mindset to have around online dating to attract the right kind of person? You know, it's funny. I think Stephen and I were just talking about this the other day. So we have this little segment that we do on my um, IGTV called A Man's Perspective. So um, women that follow me will send in various questions when they want to know, okay, like, well, what does a man really think? And one of them recently was about what is what makes a woman attractive? And one of the things that we kept talking about, and this is something, I mean, really just to answer this question, and obviously everything you're doing goes back to confidence. When you are confident, whether it's, and that translates through messages, you know, if you're, I don't want to say like needy or, <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys, I don't want to say like needy or desperate because that sounds like a little harsh, but if you are so eager to just jump on like, oh my gosh, someone messaged me, you know, versus like really taking the time to be like, okay, you know, is this person someone that I'm really interested in connecting with? Do we have a lot in common? Is this someone who I might genuinely be interested in? And then just having confidence in like, you know, Janelle, what you were saying earlier, like what you have to offer. And I think that translates, you know, through text and through phone calls and just meeting in person. And you don't have to be, you know, playing games or like, you know, give someone like the cold shoulder, you can still act that you're interested. But I think, you know, knowing at the end of the day, like, hey, you know, I have a lot to offer and I like don't deserve, I should, I should never settle. And I deserve someone who is going to treat me as well as, you know, I would treat them and who would be like a really great partner. And so I think almost just kind of 
having that demeanor and just carrying yourself, you know, with confidence versus, you know, kind of being so eager or willing, like, oh, if someone messages me, like, yes, like, I, you know, found someone they want to go out on a date, because I know when you're searching for your partner, and if it's been a while, it can feel frustrating. You're like, okay, well, maybe this person's it, maybe this person is it. But I guess I would say just kind of like, take a breath and, you know, really remember, like, everything that you deserve and ask yourself like, okay, like, is this someone that I would genuinely be interested in? And cause I think, you know, having that confidence in yourself, that definitely translates mm-hmm. through. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so I guess, what do you think are some ideas of someone like who doesn't know they're like, well, what is that? De- like, what is des- What would desperate look like? Or what would clingy look like? Like, what are some just maybe really practical little tips that would maybe come off as confident as opposed to clingy or desperate? Um, one thing I noticed is what Stephen has said. Um, if you can kind of take initiative, like every single time, not being to the guy, like, well, you plan something. Like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Like, again, having it kind of be more of a partnership and helping take the initiative to like plan dates or things of that nature. And I think just physically, like, hold your, you know, I, this sounds like silly, but, you know, like holding your shoulders up, like, actually, and we've, talked about this just power your posing. Stance. <laughs> yes but like your power pose yeah just your stance and how you carry yourself I know Steven said one time he dated a girl who was tall I mean I'm tall I'm five nine but the entire time she was hunched over because she I think just didn't like being as tall and he's like and that you know translates into like how you're holding yourself and your confidence and so I think like physically just you know carrying yourself well And I think when it comes to things like texting, you know, no one wants to, if a guy texts you like, all right, well, I'm not gonna respond for two days because like I'm playing hard to get, but also, you know, I don't want to say like, don't be blowing up their phone. But I think the other thing to remember is like everyone, especially in the beginning, you know, still has their own lives and things that you're doing. And so you can kind of be in like constant communication without constantly, you know, messaging them. Um, and so I don't know, I think that those are kind of like a few things like taking initiative, um, helping plan things physically, you know, hold it power pose, you know, holding yourself upright, shoulders back and showing confidence through that. And then just when it comes to, you know, texting or phone calls, you know, I don't just, I mean, it seems kind of obvious, like don't be blowing up someone's phone, but you know, there's an in-between between being like cold and playing games and then also being constantly like hey like what are you doing or what you know yeah I remember like this is something so silly but since we're talking about all the details I remember when I was doing all the dating stuff it's like I would try to add just a little extra lag time to what they texted me so for example if it took him like 10 minutes to text me back or 15 minutes to text me back I would try to wait that same amount of time so that way like it sounds weird but I was like kind of matching his pace yeah, no, no. Said that out loud before, but yeah, you're like, instead of being like, oh, I got a text from him. And especially, yeah, I think that can come off desperately, even if you don't mean it like that, because you're just excited right. and happy and he might be interested in you. So you're like, it's fine. I'll just message immediately back. But if he like texts you back and then every single time he has like his phone immediately lights up, lights up, lights up. It's just this like feeling of like, oh, is this girl going to be like a lot, you know? And yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like kind of a weird thing to think about, but it's just being like, and it, I think it teaches you self-control too, like as a woman or, or I guess if you're a man listening and it's the other way, but especially a woman, it teaches you self-control to not respond immediately. It teaches you to be like, okay, I'm excited about this. He's awesome. I'm excited to meet him in person, or I'm excited to continue to go on dates. But if he, you know, if, if there's like a 20 minutes like spacing, then I can wait 20 minutes too. Cause if he could wait 20 minutes, cause he's got his life to live. I can live my life for 20 minutes without going immediately into response in that text. Yeah. You said that perfectly. Totally agree. Yeah. So cool. Okay. So how soon did you know that, oh yeah, we already answered this <laughs> that question. I was going to say, how soon did you know he was the one you said pretty much that same night, but then the follow-up question was who brought up the topic of marriage and how did you guys go about that conversation? So this is actually something that I've been trying to think of recently or that Sam and I have talked about. I feel like after, because I remember we had been dating for like probably about four or five months and we had gone to go look at rings. Um, But I was in nursing school at the time and my parents wanted 
Stephen to wait to propose until I had graduated. Um, or I was supposed, sorry, we, I was supposed to graduate in December. And so we were actually looking in rings and kind of like November and December, but I was starting a new job in March at the hospital. So my parents wanted Steven just to, I think, kind of like wait until I got a little bit settled at that new job. Um, so we like knew within, I would say, you know, we were looking at rings within, you know, four or five months of being together. So we knew pretty early on and I'm, it's funny because whenever I think back, I'm trying to think, cause people have asked me this before, like, oh, well, you know, who brought it up or like, how did it come up? And I want to say, you know, I remember that there were things that Steve, actually, this is funny. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry guys. Um, so whenever we were first dating, I mean, I think it was maybe within like the first few weeks or the first month, um, Steven, you know, kind of alluded to, he was like, oh, you know, like you're someone that I could really, you know, like see myself being with. So we had both kind of expressed things, you know, to that degree. And then we actually had been together, I think it was maybe like a month and a half. And I remember we were um, visiting my parents because he had came back to me with my parents' house in Wilmington at the beach with some of his friends. And we were walking on the beach and we were just talking and he accidentally let it slip. He was like, I love you. And then it was just like one of those moments where you could tell he was like, shit, like I did not mean to say that. And so it was, I felt like there were kind of like a few things like that where we had both kind of like alluded to and knew that we felt, you know, like really serious about each other. And then, but you know, I like, Wait, did, you say it back? did you say it back? No. You were just, did you pretend like you didn't really hear it or something? Or you're just like, mm -hmm, yeah. And what were we just talking about? The beach is not No, I, yeah, I, I just remember like looking at him and you could tell he was like, oh, I just put my phone in my mouth. And I was, I just like didn't say anything back. And I think I remember at the time I had felt, you know, the same way. And like, I knew that we were going to be together, but I just wasn't like quite ready, you know, to say it. And so then I remember that um, later that summer, he had, you know, then like kind of officially or finally told me, but I think, I don't know, I'm doing a terrible job at answering this question because I can't remember exactly kind of like who brought up marriage or, but it was one of those things, you know, in the beginning, you know, the first, you know, from that first like month to, you know, three or four months, we had both kind of said things, oh, you know, like I could really see each other being together. And, you know, he had alluded, you know, like, I love you or said it, whatever. So there were kind of milestones or things like that, that I think we both just kind of knew what direction it was going in. Um, but I really can't remember kind of what was the, you know, catalyst or the main thing that then we were like, all right, we're going to go look at rings. Um, so yeah. I feel like that's like a bad way to answer it, that's but scary. that's really well, what happened. No. I can't remember. You I know. do think it's pretty organic. Like I think that when you're with the right person, especially like I said, when you're in your mid to late twenties or thirties or whatever right. it is, like by that time, and, may, and not for everyone, everyone's different. So I shouldn't make assumptions, but if you're with the right person, it, it seriously feels so organic and, and easy that it's not like some big conversation. So I sometimes wonder like, um, and I could be wrong once again, but I sometimes wonder if, if it's a huge conversation and it's like, there's so much pressure wrapped around like, who's going to bring it up? Is it going to be talked about? I sometimes wonder if that means that if there's something off or something, because if you're both really in love and you're both moving at the same pace and you're both excited about marriage, it really does unfold really naturally. It doesn't feel like some big thing. It's not some huge conversation. Like we better sit down and talk about marriage and figure out if we're on the same page like you'll just naturally be on the same page and moving at the same momentum. And then like the little things will start to happen here and there and you'll kind of be matching each other's energy, I guess. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to put it because I do think just like you said, if you both have the same, you know, vision for like where you're going together and for what the future holds, it's not really something that is like, all right, well, you know, this day is when we sat down and we were like, all right, so are we going to get married or not? Because I think, kind of to your point, and again, I, there's, everyone's situation is totally different, so I'm not saying, I, and I, so I know it's not black and white, but in my experience, some of my friends who have had those moments where they've had those conversations, it was a conversation needed to be had because 
one person wasn't moving at the same pace as the other one. So there needed to be an actual conversation of like, okay, kind of like, where do we stand on marriage? You know, is this going to be happening within the next year, the next two year? Like, I want to know if we're on the same page. But like you said, when both people are just, you know, moving at the same pace, it's not really a big conversation because like you said, you just kind of sink and it's like very organic. Yeah, totally. I love that. Okay, cool. So you guys have been married for two and a half years now. Mm -hmm. Um, What has been your favorite part about marriage? And then what's been the most challenging part? I think the favorite part, it's just, I don't know how else it is, but it's like having a partner and knowing that you always have someone that is kind of there to like encourage you and support you. It's just like having the best teammate. And, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty independent person, but at the same time, and so I know that I would be quote fine without Steven, but at the same time, it's, you don't want to be without them. And it's knowing that you guys just like have each other's backs and you kind of feel like, Hey, like we can do anything together and, you know, conquer whatever we want when we're with each other and have each other's support. And maybe that sounds kind of cliche or lame, but you know, it's, and it's having that, um, you know, someone to confide in and you always know, like at the end of the day that you guys are a team and you will be there to support each other. And I think that, I don't know, like companionship and support for lack of a better word is just like such a blessing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would think one of the most challenging parts, I think, you know, I, and I don't say this to be, because I mean, trust me, everyone's marriage has things that they can, you know, improve on and work on. But, um, you know, I feel like recently it was actually this year, Steve and I were out um, and he was actually with me and two of the girls we were with was like, oh my God, the first year of marriage is just like so hard. And like everyone said it would be. And um, they were like, oh, I just like, I know that it, it will be fine. And it's supposed to, like, everyone said it would be this way, but I don't know. I honestly we just, Steve and I remember we got back in the car and we were like, do we feel that way? Like, I don't think we felt that way. Like things have been, you know, things have been great. And of course, like we've had, you know, different obstacles, um, you know, and challenges. And, but I think, you know, we've never really run into anything where we haven't been like, Hey, like, we'll, you know, we'll figure it out. I think, you know, the one thing though, that is most challenging when you are, you know, married and you can't be selfish anymore. And most of the time it's like, you don't want to be selfish. You know, I'm happy to do things for Steven more than like anyone else, but there's still moments where like, just from human nature, you have your own agenda and things you want to do. And if they're asking you like, Hey, can you drop what you're doing? Like, I really need your help. Sometimes it's like, Oh, like, yes, <laughs> like it's you. And so like, of course I'll do it for you. But I think you know, coming to that realization that everything is about compromise. And, you know, when you're not single, you can't be selfish anymore. And it's a partnership. Yeah, I talk about that on my ebook that I sell called Get Ready and Attract Your Future Husband. And the first lesson is talking about like the grass is always green on the other side. So a lot of times single people think it's that being married is like the end all be all. And yes, marriage is amazing. But also like, when you're single, it's nice because there's some things you never have to worry about. And at that Mm -hmm. time I was living in California and through our entire dating relationship, we were supposed to live in California because Frankie lived in Denver. I lived in California and San Diego and we were doing long distance for a year. And that almost that entire year, we were supposed to move to San Diego. That was always the plan from day one because I love San Diego that much. And he always had a dream of living there at some point. So it was like, oh, perfect. But as the day get, kept getting closer and closer to him moving to Denver, or sorry, moving to San Diego, he kept just like really not wanting to move and not feeling right about it. And we were like seeking mentors and wisdom and praying and like journaling and just trying to figure out like, where are we supposed to live? Because we knew we wanted to be together, but right. we didn't know which city to live in. Um, and basically, I remember the morning I was writing this lesson, he basically called me and was like, Janelle, I don't know if I can move to San Diego. Like you might need to move to Denver. And like, that was devastating for me. Like I did not with my entire soul and being never, I did not want to move back to Colorado because that's where I lived before I moved to San Diego. And I was like, I'm not moving back there. Um, 
And for anyone who's listening, who's like moved to a new city all by themselves, need a whole life for themselves. And then you had to picture moving back to like where you came from. It's just this weird thing where you're like, I don't want to go back to where I came from. It's like taking a step backwards, even though it's not really. So in this lesson, I'm like, you know, being single isn't that bad because if I was single right now, I wouldn't have to be thinking about moving to Denver. <laughs> I'd still be I still in San Diego. Yeah, I could just stay in San Diego and be happy. But that is like truly the epitome of marriage in so many ways. Like, I mean, uprooting your entire life and moving to a new city, I'm not going to lie, has been like the most selfless thing I've probably ever done in my entire life because before that, I would just do whatever I wanted to do right. whenever I wanted to do it. And it has not been easy. Like it's worth it, but it's been painful to move to a brand new city for, you know, your husband. So we got, I moved here and then we got married a couple of weeks later. Um, and that was just like four months ago. So it's still been hard just trying to make new friends. And, and so there is like, I love what you're saying about the hardest. I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges can just be like the true selflessness that comes with it. And there are sacrifices that you have to make that you don't even can't even fathom right now, especially if you're single, right. you're like, Oh, I want marriage. You don't even understand how many sacrifices you might make at some point. And every single time it will be worth it. Like you, you won't even really second guess it. Cause you're like, I'll do anything to make this marriage work. Yeah. Like, you know, it's the right thing to do and you want to do it. But like you said, it's just the realization that, you know, when you're single, you're only responsible for yourself and yeah. Right. Totally. Okay, cool. So how have you guys um, handled or tackled hard or awkward conversations? So I think one of the things is Steve and I, from the beginning, we've always really focused on having open communication. And I think for us, we actually have what we kind of call the three day rule where if something has been on either one of our minds for three days then at that point you need to bring it up to the other person because if you've been thinking, cause you know, sometimes like someone, you know, or your husband or wife, partner, whoever, you know, does something that kind of bothers you or doesn't maybe sit with you well, or it's something you want to bring up to them. But you know, you sometimes then after you kind of like simmer down and you know, a couple hours has passed, you're like, Oh, that really wasn't a big deal. I kind of got upset over nothing, but for us, we've always kind of been like, all right, if there's something on our mind for, you know, longer than three days, then we need to bring it up to the other person. And so that's kind of, um, you know, approach we've taken. I think when we do approach it, since we've established just having like open communication, then we know that when the other person, like we know, I know if Steven comes to me about something that's hard to bring up. And if I come to him, we both know it's because the other person just wants what is best for like our marriage and our relationship. Because when you let something fester, then you end up building resentment. It ends up turning into like, you don't give the another the other person a chance to fix it. You know, it's, it can turn what would be like a, you know, molehill into a mountain or whatever the saying is. Yeah. So I think one of the things that we are really, and when bringing up the conversation, instead of saying things like, hey, well, you've made me feel this way and kind of getting defensive right off the bat. I think an important thing, at least what we do is like, hey, this is something that's been on my mind for a little while. I don't know. And it's just something that like I wanted to kind of get off my chest and talk with you about because I don't want to, you know, hold on to it any longer and kind of let it turn into more than it needs to be. And so I think kind of when you start off conversations phrasing it that way and kind of teeing it up like, Hey, I just want what's best for us. And so I would just rather have us talk about it and get it out in the open mm -hmm. versus just holding this in and becoming resentful. I think when you approach any hard conversation with that kind of sentiment, the other person knows right away that you're not going in to attack them. It's just kind of like, Hey, this is something like I've been feeling and I want what's best for us. And so I just like want to get out in the open and talk about it. Yeah. And I think it's important to say like the way it made me feel or something like that, because I know sometimes if I'm in the heat of a moment, it can be so easy to be like, yeah, it's more of an, it feels like an attack on Frankie. Right. right? Like, whoa, I can't do anything right. Like, like I can't believe you did this. Yeah. Versus right. if you're like, Hey, like when you, you know, even like something silly, but it's like, Hey, when you don't, 
load your dish. Actually, this is my problem that he hates that I don't load my dish fast enough. When you don't load your dish, it makes it feel like you, you know, I feel like you don't listen to me or you don't care about the things I've told you that matter to me or whatever. Like it's coming from a place of emotion rather than coming from a place of like nitpicking that little item, you know? Right. Like, why aren't you loading the dishwasher? Or like, why aren't you versus like, Hey, this is how it's making, it makes me feel like you don't value. And I think another thing, like when talking about hard things is I think it's important. That's something we've tried to do more is to almost repeat back what the other person has said in the sense where, so if Steven says something to me, I'm like, okay, well, so just to clarify, like, I just want to make sure I understand you're feeling that, you know, X, Y, or Z, because I think a lot of times in like emotionally charged conversations, which when you're bringing up, you know, more difficult things, they tend to be more emotionally charged or heavy. And so I think just being really clear and having those kind of like clear lines of communication, I think is really helpful also. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, the like repeat back thing. It feels a little therapisty because that's- Yeah, but <laughs> but really, I mean, there's a reason why they do that, right? It's like, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is this. And sometimes when you repeat it back, they might be like, oh, well, I guess that's not exactly what I meant. And then they try to reword it and you're like, okay. And then I like, so this, and then they're like, and you get closer and closer to like actually solving the problem or like getting to the root of the issue as opposed to just like staying on the surface level. Yeah. Cause I know there's definitely been times that we've been like in a disagreement and I'll say something and he's like, no, no, no. Like, that's not what I meant. I'm like, but you just said, you know, X, Y, or Z. He's like, no, like you're, you're not like putting words in my mouth, but like, no, you're changed. Like you're taking what I said the wrong way. And so that kind of prevents reaching that next level. And then you're arguing about like, no, it's not what I meant. That's not what I said. Yeah, exactly. So you're like, you did say it. And he's like, well, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah. So yeah, those are the words that you said. <laughs> <laughs> I should have recorded it. Then I could prove it to you. Um, yes. And I think that like, if someone's listening right now, and if you are having a hard time bringing up awkward or, or um, tough conversations, I think one part is it's working on yourself and, and realizing your value and realizing that you are lovable and that you are, you are worth this hard conversation. I mean, this goes across the board, whether it's a hard conversation at work, a hard conversation within your significant other, with a, a mother, a brother, a friend. It's knowing that it's worth bringing up and that your feelings matter. I think often when I speak with women, it's, it's, they're trying to brush it off because they think, oh, well, it's really not that big of a deal, or I just don't want to address it. Like, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to hurt feelings. And you got to be willing to rock the boat. You got to be willing to, um, not, you're not going to hurt. I mean, the goal isn't to hurt feelings, but yeah, sometimes when someone addresses something, it does hurt your feelings at first, especially when it's coming from a place of love. Like your loved ones who come and bring up hard topics to you, it's always hard to hear in the moment, but later on, you're like, wow, I'm so grateful they brought that Better up. Better to bring up sooner rather than later. Right. And, and it hurts in the moment, but long term, it's, you know, the person loves you and that they're doing it out of a place of love and respect. And so I think it's just learning to value your voice and value your emotions and value your, your thoughts. Because if you're so afraid that you're going to go into this conversation, that he's going to be like angry or mad or, or something like that, then it's, it's being like, okay, he's not going to be, as long as I go into it with a loving, from a loving place and explain it to him, he's not going to get angry. He's not going to get mad. Or if he does, it might just be for a little bit as we work through it. Um, and I guess if he is the type of person that does get angry and mad really easily, then, then maybe there's, there's more to do there where maybe therapy right. or something might be a good option for you guys to go to probably separately where you can go through a therapist and you can go to a different therapist and you guys can, um, work through stuff individually so that way you get become better for each other totally agree cool okay awesome um so i think i'm gonna move on to our portion where we talk about sex speaking of awkward topics that was <laughs> yeah exactly let's talk about you and me okay so i have so many random sex questions you guys but you all told me you wanted to talk about sex so here we are um how often do you and steven have sex so I would say on average, once to twice a week. Once and a yeah. And this is something um, just to kind of like dive into it. And I know some of the things that, you know, like we talked about based on what people were interested in hearing, this is something that has been one of like, if I had to kind of pick one of the more 
I guess, like challenging things in our relationship. You know, Stephen, his love language is physical touch. Mine is acts of service, not the sexual kind. <laughs> <laughs> like taking out the trash time, Stephen. Okay, do anything to make my life easier, and I'll love you. Um, no, so this is something that we have had that we've had not like consistent conversations about, where it's like you know every week it's something we're talking about, but it's something that you know we definitely touch base on more frequently, just because I know he, and I also think not for everyone, but almost every friend I have, you know, the men's libido is just a lot higher than, you know, the woman's not in every case, but it's not uncommon. And so I'm just saying this because I know there's some times where I felt like, oh, should I be wanting to have sex more? You know, is there a problem with me? Because sometimes that's how it can feel whenever you and your partner have different, you know, desires for lack of a better word. And so, you know, I know a lot of the girlfriends that I've spoken to, you know, feel a little, they're like, oh my gosh, they're like, nope, same, same issue. Like nothing's wrong with you. (laughs) And so I just say that to kind of say it's very, and I actually have a girlfriend where they have the opposite problem where she wants sex a lot more than he does. But I just kind of bring all that up to say it's very um, uncommon for two people Um, you know, after you've been together for especially like a few years to have the same libido. And so for us, like that's something that we are just like very open about and like all kind of check in with him and be like, hey, like, how are you feeling on this? You know, I have been trying to make more of an effort because I know that it is something that is more important to you. And so sometimes since it's not as a big of priority to me, I don't even like think about it. Whereas, you know, he's over there like, oh, well, you know, it's been three or four days and we haven't had sex. So I think just like having open, again, going back to having open communication about things and being able to talk about it versus just kind of like sweeping it under the rug and being like, oh, well, like nothing's been brought up. So like everything's fine. So sorry, I kind of just took that. And, but I just. So is it planned or is it spontaneous? Um, Spontaneous, but. I will say, you know, I've said to him before, because we both, you know, work basically. So we both work from home, you know, together almost like every day of the week. You know, Stephen was in school full time as a student that actually like just ended yesterday. And then I work um, at the hospital as a nurse, but I work PRN. So I'm just there a few shifts a month. And otherwise I'm at home working on my blog. So we are together working from home a lot. And so I think since, you know, we kind of like have our own businesses and things that we're working on, we almost, you know, we work kind of seven days a week. You know, it's from when we wake up at seven in the morning until like eight at night when we make dinner, we're kind of working and, you know, in the zone. And so something we really had to kind of work on sex will be spontaneous, but sometimes we've kind of had to realize, hey, we might not be having it as much as you know, you want or we want because we kind of get into our routine and we don't really like make time for it because after you've been working for, you know, 12 hours and it's time to make dinner, then like you're tired and like you just like want to go to bed. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's almost kind of planning like, hey, like not necessarily planning for it, but I will say, you know, the only thing not sexier than, or what is the phrase? Shit. It's basically like talking about, you know, you might think like it's not sexy to have sex planned, but what's less se- sexy is not having sex at all. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, I've gone to like marriage conferences back when I was single because I was putting them on through my church. So yeah, that was fun. Um, and they would talk about like planned sex pretty often of like putting it in like a schedule and like literally scheduling it. Like I think this guy, him and his wife had been married for like 20 or 25 years or something. And they had like three planned sex times each week or whatever. Yeah. I I mean, if that's what, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. You got to put it. It's like, I mean, it sounds kind of ridiculous. It's kind of like a workout. Like I love working out and working out feels good. But if I don't plan for it, especially like if I wake up and I just kind of see what happens, 
sometimes it doesn't happen, you know? And, yeah. No, it's it, a very, that's like a really good comparison. Yeah. I love it. After I work out, I'm like, yes, I'm so glad I did that. And a lot of times that's how sex is too. Like you might not be super in the mood, like right in that moment, at right. least maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I might be like, no, I agree. Hey. But by the time we're done, I'm like, wow, glad we did that. that yeah. You're fun. never like, oh, that was terrible. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I love that. Um, okay. So have you ever had a time in your life where your sex life wasn't awesome? And what did you do to spice things up again? Well, I guess just kind of going kind of like what I was saying earlier. Um, I don't feel like, you know, we've reached a point where we're like, oh, wow, like our sex life is really, you know, terrible. But I think we also realize that since we have kind of like different libidos and, you know, Steven would want it X amount of, would X amount of times and I'd be okay with, you know, like less for lack of a better word. It's just something that we have had to be open about. And I've also talked to him about, hey, you know, during like each week, let's have a planned date night to like Mm -hmm. spend time together. And like, not that you can only like have sex like after a date night, but I think there's something different about being intentional about spending time together. And again, planning to spend time together versus like, oh, do you just want to go out and grab something to eat? You know, there's just like a little bit of a different feeling and sentiment to it. And so that's something that, you know, we try to do each week. And I think kind of implementing things like that. And just, I, sometimes I tell Steven, I'm like, Hey, like you coming in, like, cause he'll be like, Oh, like I touch you all the time. Like I, you know, show you that like, I want to have sex all the time. And I'm like grabbing like my boobs, like randomly in the kitchen while I'm trying to make something like, <laughs> is yes. it like, that's like, that's not getting me in the mood. I'm not like, Oh yeah. Like I'm so turned on. And so I've tried to tell him like, you have to be like a little more like, romantic or the foreplay can't just be like so I think again (laughs) having those conversations like let's just be on the same page what you know gets both of us in the mood yes men are just like so different yeah and Frankie and I have like talked about this before but it's like men are microwaves and women are crockpots like yes take a little bit longer to warm up we have like there's a lot more emotional like guys can just like bring I'm ready and also like yeah I need you to like rub my back a little and so I I yeah, it's, it's really learning to communicate that stuff. And I've said that stuff to Frankie. It's like, hey, you know what gets me in the mood? Yeah, not grabbing my boob. It's actually like giving me a little back massage or tickling. That's like literally know, verbatim back. what I've said. Yeah. Like, and so, and I actually started to do a little bit of research about this, which is funny because I like never did research on this stuff before marriage. Um, and so it's so weird for me to like Google sex things. But um, I was Googling like, the difference between men and women with sex. And it was talking about how women have the best orgasm when they've had 15 to 20 minutes of foreplay leading up. And so mm-hmm. I told that to Frankie, like, just so you know, like we will always need to have 15 to 20 minutes, like pretty much across the board, you know, like uh, of course here and there, maybe we'll have a, a quickie or something. But for me, for me to enjoy it, I need at least 20 minutes of like kissing and cuddling and And there might be some guys who are listening right now who's like, that sounds high maintenance. Or maybe some girls who are listening who are like, my husband would never do that. Well, have you told him that that's what you want? Because usually your partner does want you to have the best experience possible because you both want to love it. And so if you want to love it and that's what you need, then yeah. You need to communicate that. Communicate that, totally. And the other thing I'll say um, for anyone listening, my friend Tegan gave me this book actually, and I can't remember what it's called. So I'm going to link it down below. Wait, but it's it, not how to make love last, is it? By no, John Gottman. Okay, it's not. That's another good one. That's a good book. Okay, cool. You guys note that one. No, this one is like a sex book where basically like there's different pages that you rip out and one is for men and one is for women. And it's like a little envelope kind of thing. So I can't see the men's one and he can't see the women's one. And on it, it'll say like, the woman's. So for example, I don't know, I haven't done these yet. I got, I have the book, but we're going to like, we were thinking about using it maybe like when we weren't newlyweds. Cause right now we're newlyweds. So like, you know, we're, we're not really struggling in this area. Yeah. yeah. That's what uh, I was about to say. Yeah. And the fur in the beginning, it's like, yeah. It's like every night. You're like, all right, let's go. Um, but <laughs> it's like, you it's uh, okay this is just one that I think I remember her saying it's something like for the guy he rips it out and it's not like going and getting chocolate or something from the store and maybe like getting whipped cream and then like you send a picture I don't know there's like little like steps that lead you up to it throughout the day so you can like get prepared so if you and your significant other are struggling in this department which numerous people 
wrote in this thing that said like what to do when you're struggling with intimacy. So I know this is a problem for some people and that's totally normal, just so you know. Um, but it, this book might help you because it will help spice things up a little bit because you'll that's be like, about to say, yeah, spice doing, it up a little bit. Yeah. Give you some things. ideas. Yeah. One for the girl to the guy is like put on a white t-shirt and while he's in the shower, just randomly get in the shower with him wearing your white t-shirt. Um, just like something like that, that like for us, it's like, okay, but for him, really hot. And so yeah, exactly. Uh, things maybe, that we wouldn't necessarily think about, but yeah. Yeah. It like encourages you with like steps of how to like amp up the foreplay, I guess. So Okay. I feel like, I feel like we covered pretty well. I mean, we could probably talk about sex for another like 20 minutes, but since we only have a couple minutes left, we'll, we'll continue onward. All right. Um, let's talk about finances. The other hot topic. Um, are you guys' finances together or separate? Together. Um, yeah. yeah. Basically when we kind of got married, it was, you know, what's mine is his and what's his is mine. And so we have, um, separate checking accounts and like separate savings accounts, but, um, and we both have like separate business credit cards, but then we have one um, like joint credit card, but like my name is on his bank account and his is on mine. So yes, like we have separate accounts, but I mean, it's really just kind of like all one big pot for lack of a So then who, like, if, if like you have a checking and he has a checking and you guys both have your own businesses and you have like stuff auto withdrawing or like rent or something like do you have different tasks that are delegated to different people or? so our situation is a little bit different because basically for the last like i was saying you know three years steven has been in school so he has not had an income so um he his job kind of a long backstory he's working on a separate business right now but basically it's not profitable at the moment it's just in the beginning stages so Really, while he was in school, he was working on that. But his, quote, job, I mean, he would help me with my business and my brand. So really, all the money technically would be deposited in my account from, you know, either the hospital or brands that I would work with. And so that's where all the bills and everything would be paid from. And then um, if I would, then we would transfer part of that money to his checking. But that would be more so like if he, you know, just so he could have money like in his checking account, but bills and everything, we would just have it like auto drafted from my account. It'll be interesting to see, you know, now that he's graduated and our financial situation will be changing some, um, kind of like what the dynamic of like, oh, well, what's drafted from where? And, but we've always just kind of had that mentality of, you know, everything is both of ours together, okay. kind of like regardless of what account it's in but we've just kind of had a little bit of an interesting setup given that he's been in school yeah yeah so what has it been like um for you being the breadwinner and then what has it been like for steven um being like on the receiving end of that um so i think like you know this is something that we have talked about and i think for steven you know and i mean and me both like it's never really been a thing like whether you know, if I was going back to school and he was making the money, I don't think anyone would say anything or anyone would think anything. And it's kind of the same for us. Like, just because he's in school, like, I'm happy to help support him. I know he would do the same for me. And it's funny because it's not really anything that has kind of crossed either of our, like, oh, you know, like, I'm the woman and I'm the quote breadwinner, which like isn't as traditional. But, you know, it kind of makes me sad because I've had women reach out to me saying, oh, you know, my husband and I are in a similar situation and we've had friends and family making comments like, well, it doesn't matter that your husband's in school, like he needs to be getting a job just mm. for you guys. And I mean, Steve and I have always kind of been like, we're a team, like we're partners. If one of us wants, if we both decide like, hey, this is what the other person should do, like in this case, Steven going back to school, you know, that's a decision we made together and we're going to support each other. It doesn't matter like if I'm quote bringing in the money or if he is because the other person is helping out. There's other ways to help out besides monetarily yeah. and like you're a team. So yeah. I don't know. It's just something that we've never really, it doesn't even like really cross our minds if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Yeah, I know. I can speak from the other side where as I've been growing my business, because when I was working for myself doing Next Level Confident, 
um, one-on-one coaching. It was like half personal training, half life coaching. Um, I was bringing in more money, but now that I've shifted and I'm doing the confidence workshop full time, and now I'm getting into the corporate world and teaching workshops there. But as I'm building that business, I'm not bringing in as much money as I was. And it's, I mean, it's just tough because for me, I want to be bringing in lots of money and I want to be like, I want to be contributing. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting because that has been a conversation for Frankie and I fairly often where like, I am like, I'll have like freak outs. I'm like, I don't want to use your money. He's like, it's our money. And, and obviously once again, we're like really new to marriage. So it's only been like three, four months. It's still such a weird idea to me that I would be like using someone else's money. And I think part of it's how I was raised was very like, I bought my own cell phone and paid my own cell phone bill at the age of 13. I, when I wanted a car at 16, I started to pay for the gas and the car insurance at 16. Like I've always paid for all my own things. And so for me to like accept Frankie's income, that's something that's going to support us right now as I'm continuing to build my business. Um, it's super humbling. Like I'm, I'm so grateful for it. I know it's a blessing, but sometimes it like, I mean, even talking about, I'm literally getting emotional right now because it like hurts, it hurts my heart almost because I'm, I think it's just pride. Honestly, it's me being prideful and being like, I want to bring the money. I want to pay for things. I want to be like self-sufficient. And it's, it, um, it ends up being kind of humbling to allow someone else to, to pay the bills. Um, when I've paid my own bills for so long. And so it's been kind of a learning lesson for me. It's like, wow, this is what it looks like to receive. This is what it looks like to, to be reliant on someone for, for, at least a while and, and we're married. So of course we're reliant, but I don't know. It's this weird, this weird thing. Yeah. It, and like, I know with Steven, you know, he's made comments. He's like, I'm just ready to like, you know, make money and like, I want to support you. But I think, and so I understand that and I know that's how he feels, but I think also both of us were like, Hey, you're doing something to better yourself for our future. And I know there will probably be a time where, um, I mean, hopefully not, but, um, you know, if, but if there's a time in the future where something goes, is happening with my business and like, I'm not making as much or like, I can't afford, like, I know that he would step up and cause again, it's just like, you are, I know it's kind of a, a shift you have to go through when you're not used to relying on someone and having someone else pay for things. But I just think it's like, we like to just try to think of it, you know, at the end of the day, we're a team and, you know, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without Steven's help and support. And yeah, it's not like monetary help and support, but like my blog and, you know, my business would not be what it is today without Steven, you know, taking the time, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to help me. And so I think just remembering it's like, you guys are both a team. And as long as it's something that you guys have like open conversations, they should, I'm not saying like you to you and Frank, but like just people, yeah. you know, yeah. in general, like an open conversation about, um, I think again, just kind of going back to like open lines of communication and there's no right or wrong way. But I know for us, we're just like, Hey, you know, what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And like, we both know we're doing what's what we need to do and what's best, you know, mm-hmm. for our quote family. So yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, I have one more finance question and then we got to wrap this sucker up because we are like running way over on time. If you guys are still listening right now, thank you for still listening. We're, I think, like an hour and five minutes possibly. Oh gosh, okay. (laughs) People are like, uh, are they almost done? No, if you're still listening, you're probably enjoying this, I hope. Um, So the last question is, um, do you guys have a budget and then who like more implements the budget? Um, So we have a budget in terms of... Hmm. Well, okay. I should say this. We don't really, we don't have a strict budget for things because right now, more or less, a lot of our money has, we've basically invested back into, so I'm launching an athleisure line next summer. Steven is working on an energy drink mix. So really the money that we normally would be saving more of and budgeting with is like going all back into both of our businesses. So again, our setup is a little bit different, I guess, but um, we definitely are like conscious of kind of like each month in terms of, okay, like there was one point in time we were looking at our bills and we're like, all right, we go out to eat a lot, like we need to rein that in. And so even though 
we don't have like specific budgets for like entertainment or going out to eat. It's things that like we're definitely cognizant of. But I think right now, since so much of our money is essentially being put back into like two of our businesses, our budgets are aside from basically like paying off credit cards and um, putting money into like retirement and then like a certain number of our paychecks each month go into savings. Those are kind of like the three things that we focus on as far as kind of keeping control of our finances. Okay. So you're like pay all the bills and then the other three <laughs> things on top of the bills are pay off debt um, and then put money into your future. So like a 401k or a, a, a Roth or simple IRA or yeah. something like that. And then what was the last one you said? And then basically like 15% of each like paycheck I get from like a brand will go into savings. Savings. Okay. Yeah. 15%. So that's kind of like how we have it set up right now. Cool. I love that. And that's, and that is also like a tip our accountant gave us. Cause we were asking her like, Oh, well, should we have budget, you know, for different categories? And she was like, your focuses should be not having, you know, a credit card bill at the end of the month, putting money into retirement and then having, she technically said, three to six months of ex living expenses at all times should be right. the things. And she was like, as long as you're doing those three things, like you really don't need to worry about like budgeting for each individual like area. So that's kind of how we approach it. Yeah. That's good. That's so good. Okay, cool. So to wrap up, if you could give each listener to, if you could have each listener walk away with one smart action step, what would you urge listeners to do? Wait, is SMART, is this like the acronym? Yeah, do you know that one? Yeah. Um, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timely. Okay, so I guess for me, I would say when it comes to, I think, and this is something kind of going back to the Rise podcast, this is a little, not businessy, but kind of going back to trying to think and figure out like what your purpose is, but kind of think about where you want to be in the next you know, year, let's say. And so pick like one goal or one thing you want to accomplish within the next year. And then I would say, you know, write down a list of, again, like those smart action steps of what you are going to accomplish. Maybe it's like by the end of like each month, like one of the mini goals that you're going to do to get to that, you know, ultimate goal in a year. So if it's, let's say you really want to like run a marathon, then I would say map out like, okay, well, like how long is a marathon? Is it, okay, let's just say it's like 30 miles. It's 27. I think it's 27. 27. So like yeah. So like, let's say, you know, like that's the one big goal that you like really want. Then I would break that down and say, okay, so, you know, the month, like if I have to run 27 miles by that day, the month before I want to hit like 24 miles and the month before that, and kind of like breaking down, you know, like one really big goal you have for yourself so you can put in some actionable items to get you there. Because when you break down like the one thing I feel like that you really want to work towards, it seems less scary versus mm -hmm. like, oh, like I really want to do this, but I have no idea like how to get there. Yeah. It's like, like when I wanted to start a podcast, it was like, what are the, all the elements that you need to start a podcast? I'm like, okay, well, I need a platform to host it on. And I need, you know, uh, a microphone. And, and so it's breaking it down and doing the small little goals. And then I would say to bring it like full circle with relationship, it's, it's telling your spouse, like what you broke down and maybe even doing this exercise with you. Yeah, I probably should have made that towards, um, the example towards, but towards the relationship. Okay. Well, being yeah, like one... yourself as part of, part of, you know, the right. relationship. So I think you're right. It's like setting a goal and maybe it's setting a goal together. So maybe that's getting out of debt or maybe that's to buy a house or maybe that's to get your dream car or maybe it's going to dog I don't know. or a date night once a week, date night once a week. Right. Yeah. breaking it down and be like, how can we afford this financially? Or how can we get a sitter if you have kids or, or whatever, just, um, sitting down together and creating a goal together or creating separate goals and then sitting down and talking about it. So you, it's like, how can I support you and how can you support me? Also, I would just say one last thing, writing it down, because if you write it down, you are much more likely to do it. So five times, five literally times today, likely write it down what you want so you can hold yourself accountable. Yes. You and your spouse can hold each other accountable to this goal, especially when you tell someone else, it's like this higher level of accountability to know, right. oh crap, I better actually do this. Love it. Okay. Well, Claire, thank you so much for being on the show. I hope 
everyone listening, I hope you guys got lots of value, lots of new thoughts or things to think about and mull around and, and maybe make your significant other listen to this too. If, if some of these topics are things you want your significant other to know about, listen together and discuss afterwards and see what kinds of ideas you guys came up with together to strengthen your relationship. So you can find Claire once again on Instagram at Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E. Yes. Yes. <laughs> G-U-E-N-T-Z. That's um, perfect. And yeah. So, and check out their podcast once again. The husband. husband and wife podcast. Yep. Yeah. And you guys can find me everything, my blog, everything is just Claire Gens. And then the podcast is just the husband and wife podcast. Yay. Thank you, Claire. You're amazing. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me and everyone listening. I hope you guys got a lot of value and takeaways from today. And thanks for listening to the end with me and Janelle. Yay.